All right, we'll uh, get started and I'll uh, check in to see if anyone else comes and I'll uh, let them in. So uh, thank you for coming. Today's uh, Tech Talk is an intro to 3D printing. So this is just gonna be a basic, a very basic overview of um, kind of what 3D printing is, uh, what we have at the library and um, you know, where it's headed in terms of uh, sort of the big picture. Uh, my name is Josh Fire. I'm a librarian here at Merrick Library. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Okay? All right, so starting off, what is 3D printing? 3D printing technology is already changing. Hold on, so 3D printing is a process for making a physical object from a three-dimensional digital model, typically by laying down many successive thin layers of material. So it brings a digital object, it's a CAD representation, which is a computer-aided design, Means, uh, into its physical form by adding a layer of materials. So I just had this brief um, video that I'll share uh, that goes into it a little bit more. Let me know if you have any trouble uh, hearing it. In the way we produce 3D printing technology is already changing the way we produce objects from tools and toys to clothing and even body parts. 3D printing is part of a process known as additive manufacturing, where an object is created by adding material layer by layer. Additive manufacturing allows designers to create complex parts for machines, airplanes, and cars at a fraction of the cost and time of standard means like forging, molding, and sculpting. Now, smaller, consumer-friendly 3D printers are bringing additive manufacturing to homes and businesses. The first step in 3D printing is to create a blueprint of the object you want to print. You can use modeling software like Blender to create your own designs, or you can visit websites like Thingiverse or Shapeways to find objects other users have 3D modeled. Once you have a finished design, it's time to send it to the printer. Some printers, like the MakerBot Replicator 2, have renewable bioplastics spooled in the back of the device, almost like a string. When the printer receives the data, it pulls the material through a tube, melts it, and deposits it to the plate where it instantly cools. As you can see, the 3D object is created through layering, where the printer will add one layer of the object at a time until you have a fully formed structure. The most common material used in 3D printing is plastic. But the use of some other materials allow for the creation of some pretty amazing products beyond simple tools and toys. 3D printing food is becoming very popular, and additive manufacturing has allowed for the creation of some pretty intricate treats. In the medical world, doctors are testing biomaterials for regenerative medicine. By using a patient's cells, doctors could 3D print small body parts like ears and noses. Some surgeons have even tested 3D printed organs for transplants. Recently, giant 3D printers in China printed 10 houses in just one day and at a cost of less than $5,000 per house, proving just how cost and time efficient 3D printing can be. For more on 3D printing, check out Mashable's latest coverage. And don't forget to watch the other videos in our Mashable Explained series. 3D printing technology is already changing the world. All right, so I hope that that just uh, gave you sort of a quick overview of what we're talking about here. Um, obviously, we're not building houses here, but uh, I think it's pretty cool to see all the different ways in which it's being used around the world to kind of give you an idea of why it's important and why we thought that it'd be uh, something you know, to be able to do on, on a small level in the library. Um, actually, I had a tooth implant a few years ago they told me that they actually 3D printed the tooth um, in order to, uh, to have the right uh, sizing and everything for it. They, they did a mold for it and then they 3D printed it, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting. So obviously that's not the kind of 3D printer we have here, but just to give you an idea of the fact that in, in the real world it's being used. Okay. So I just wanted to go over some general 3D printing terms that you're gonna hear so that you know, to, to get you to be aware of it so that uh, when you hear it, you're not totally confused because there's a lot of lingo here uh, that, that is part of it. So uh, one of the things I think they mentioned in that video was additive manufacturing. So that's the process of creating a 3D object by fusing one layer on another. So that's different than removing or carving out a material, such as in traditional machine. You know, 
chop down a tree and then you make a chair out of it. This is different because you're creating an object by just doing one layer at a time and then building it. Um, and the way that that's done is this fused deposition model. So it's the additive manufacturing process in which plastic filament is heated and fed through an extruder to build your object layer by layer. So that's what the three printers that we have do is it's basically melting plastic one layer at a time and building on it uh, to create the object. Slicing. So uh, we call that the process of taking a 3D model and then translating this model into individual layers in any other 3D printing software. So your 3D printer uses information generated during slicing to build your 3D printing object. So for example, I'll show you later, um, what's called the, the Prusa slicer is the object that is the um, software that we use here to uh, kind of get the, pro the uh, project ready to be printed. It's, it's called slicing. So filament is uh, the thermoplastic material used to build your 3D prints. So it's basically plastic, uh, have some, uh, right here. So it comes like this, you know, with different colors and you just uh, basically printing, you're, you're pulling this, uh, pulling this filament into the 3D printer. And this is what it's melting to create um, an object. Uh, the extruder is the hot glue gun of your 3D printer. So that's, the extruder uses filament to draw out the layers of your 3D prints has a cold end to pull and feed the thermoplastic filament from a spool, and then a hot end that it goes to that melts and extrudes the thermoplastic. This heat of thermoplastic forms your print. Um, and then the build plate uh, is the surface on which prints are made. So um, as you can see, uh, this is um, one of our 3D printers, and this is the build plate that actually comes off. And you can see we're just uh, testing out uh, the filaments that are in some way, it's just put here like that. But this is the build plate that it's going to uh, build it onto. All right, and then here are some terms to know for preparing your files for printing. So you'll see STL. So that's kind of like, you know, uh, if you're printing like a Word document, it's a dot .doc. Um, uh, dot .stl stands for stereolithographic file format. And so that's the file format that's commonly used with Google. Um, OBJ is another one that's an object file format. So it's commonly used for on screen visualization of 3D printing. Um, and then G code is an important one. So G code is the control code that you use to print 3D models on your 3D printer. So you will need to convert your design file, most likely in the form of an STL file, and you turn it into a series of G codes, the language that you print the files and uses. So generally, what we're doing is we're downloading um, or creating STL files. Um, and that's basically the, you know, the 3D object. But then when you need to get it ready to print, you're gonna use the slicer software to uh, basically set it up for the printer, and turn it into a G-code, and then you print the G-code. A raft is um, an additional stabilizing surface at the print's base that helps ensure better print quality. Uh, rafts can be removed and discarded after the print is complete. So a lot of the times, um, in order to make sure that it's, it's uh, staying on the, the build plate, um, you're going to kind of want to put something on the bottom there to make sure that it's stable. And so that's called a wrap. And then, you know, when it's done, you kind of just pop the wrap off and then you have your object. Um, overhang is when a layer extends outward, potentially unsupported over the previous layer. So it's something you have to think about when you're, uh, you know, printing 3D files is this idea that, um, you know, if you have like a say a snowman that you're trying to print and you have an arm hanging out, the arm is unsupported and it's not gonna be able to easily print that arm just like out of nowhere. It kind of, because it's building on um, layer after layer, you sometimes need to add supports um, to, to help the overhang. So that's my next thing is the supports, which is a remo removable scaffolding structure, uh, structure built to help parts of an object that would otherwise be in midair with no material below. So that's how you're going to deal with the overhang in a print is by creating support. And usually it's just um, basically something you click off in the slicer software in order to uh, add the supports. And then infill is the support structure built in the interior of the 3D model. So typically infill is set between 10 to 15 percent. So to create a fully solid object, the infill density must be at 100 percent. Uh, the lower the infill de uh, density, the lighter and more hollow your object will be. So it's kind of this idea that, you know, uh, 
the lower the infill, quicker it's going to print. But if you go kind of uh, you know, too low of a percentage, it's going to just be uh, not really suitable and it's not going to print correctly. But you know, if you did 100% infill, it would, it would take forever. So you're, you're trying to figure out the uh, sort of right percentage that's going to work for whatever you're trying to print. All right, so then I just want to talk about the 3D printers we have here at the Merrick Library. So first, I just wanted to tell you a little bit of history of the Merrick Makerspace. So after reading about the first makerspace being developed at the Fayetteville Library in Ornendonger County in upstate New York, uh, then director Ellen Pryor decided to look into creating that technology in Merrick. So with then assistant director Marisa Crowley and computer specialist Mike Chu, they visited the MakerBot factory in Brooklyn, one of the first companies to create a 3D printer. So after seeing what the 3D printer could create and realizing how it could be uh, creating a new mini revolution in technology, Merrick Library decided to create the first makerspace on Long Island. So uh, after the death of the president of the Merrick Library board, Walter Mintz, uh, the library was able to convert a storage room into a makerspace with donations in Mr. Mintz's memory. So that was the beginning of a movement to add makerspaces to public libraries. Now you will find 3D printers in medical facilities, architectural firms, and all kinds of industries, uh, as we saw in the video and as well as universities and libraries. So we've seen patrons come in and print parts for their boats, as well as create toys, jewelry, and more. But uh, I just thought that was interesting to know because uh, you know, Merrick is actually uh, kind of at the vanguard of this 3D printing movement in libraries. We were the first ones on Long Island to have a, a maker space and have 3D printers. And um, you know, now you'll find them in a lot of the libraries and, you know, and, and some have even fancier ones than we have here now, but you know, we, were, we were the first. So, that it's interesting to know about. Um, and then the 3D printers at the Merrick Library, that's a picture of the, you know, the kind of uh, printer we have, which are Prusa printers. So we started with uh, a MakerBot printer, as I said in the last uh, slide, because MakerBot was actually in uh, Brooklyn. They were kind of, and at the time, they were kind of the best known ones. Um, so a few brands have this impeccable reputation of fervent fan base, like Cheche based Prusa Research in terms. So Prusa is in, uh, in Europe, but they're, they're very well known for these um, kind of low cost, um, high quality printers now. So manufacturer Prusa Research constantly improves every aspect of its open source ecosystem from hardware to software. And the upgrades in the Prusa i3 and K3 3D printer were made after gathering feedback from this community. The new and improved Prusa i3 and K3S has a completely redesigned extruder system and includes all of the cumulative upgrades that have been made to the model over time. And so that's the uh, models that we have. We have two Prusa i3 and K3S 3D printers. So creating 3D digital designs with Tinkercad. So say you wanted to create something from scratch. That you're going to do using a um, software that we call Tinkercad. So Tinkercad is free. It's an easy to use app for 3D design, electronics, and coding. It's used by teachers, kids, hobbyists, and designers to imagine design and make anything. So again, I have a quick video here I'll just show you. <laughs> oh, hi. You like making stuff with your hands, right? Well, have you ever wondered if a computer could help you make even more? Then you should know about Tinkercad. It helps you make just about anything your imagination can dream up. Watch this. From the very first click, you're making stuff. A thing, a mess, anything you want. The best part is, Tinkercad helps you take your designs out of me and into the real world by showing you how to 3D print them. Laser cut. Fill them with bricks. Or make things light up and spin. Why? Because with Tinkercad, you can. And because keeping things flat is boring. Sign up for Tinkercad now. It's free and works on any computer with an internet connection. Not to mention, it saves your designs for you up there. Be a change maker and join the growing community of curious doers in the 3D fun revolution. Tinkercad, from mind to design in minutes. All right, so I'm just going to show you quickly um, 
what Tinkercad looks like. And so you can download it, but you can also just use it in the browser. Let me just make sure if this uh, sharing my Tinkercad screen. Okay. So say you want to create a new design, you click uh, here, create a new design. And this is sort of what it looks like. Um, usually I start by changing this edit grid. You change the units to uh, inches instead of millimeters. You change the snap grid to uh, 164 to make it a little bit more precise. And so, uh, you know, say you wanted to create um, just a little 3D printed thing that says a phrase on it. So like I was saying with the rafts here, you might want to start by uh, creating kind of a, something on the bottom here so it's not just free floating. So you have that. So, you know, and this is just, um, just the red block, basically. And then here we can add text. So say we add this text here. Let's make this a little small. So, okay, oops. Put this text on top here. Change what it says. want to make it green, change the color, kind of want to change the size of it so that it uh, fits on top of this, this thing. You know, and so that's um, how it looks from the different perspectives. And um, that's basically it. And so then if you wanted to uh, export this, you know, it's say here for 3D printing, here's your different files, you know, you could do a, an STL file, and that's you know what you're going to turn into a G code if you wanted to print. So I mean that's very basic, but um, you know there's there's a lot of uh, if, if you're in Tinkercad, you can learn a lot just um, by looking around. They have a lot of uh, little modules to teach you, um, you know the intricacies of it, and they it's really meant for kids in school. So you know it does a good job of, of teaching you know, anyone. It's pretty clear to follow. So if you really are interested in this stuff, there's, there's a lot to uh, dig into there. And then like I, like I said, it's free. So if you're really interested, you can uh, go and check that out. Okay. So that, again, that's a very basic uh, intro for, for Tinkercad. All right, so the other thing is that we want to talk about is uh, finding digital designs to 3D print through Thingiverse. So this is how most people who come into the library are, um, you know, printing things. That's how, for example, you know, I have this uh, dog that I printed. I found this on Thingiverse. This is a, like a cat phone holder that I, I found on Thingiverse. So there's just lots of, you know, already pre-made things that you, uh, you can find on Thingiverse. So, uh, Thingiverse comes from MakerBot, uh, which again, we mentioned before, they were kind of, um, you know, they, they're still making 3D printers, but uh, they, there are other brands that have kind of uh, surpassed them for the affordable, you know, solid uh, 3D printers, but um, they own Thingiverse. Um, and MakerBot's Thingiverse is a thriving design community for design, discovering, making, and sharing 3D printable things. That's the world's largest 3D printed community. They believe that everyone should be encouraged to create and remix 3D things, no matter their effective their expertise or previous experience. In the spirit of maintaining an open platform, all designs are encouraged to be licensed under a Creative Commons license, meaning that anyone can use or alter any design. All right, so I'll just show you what that looks like um, a little bit. So this is the uh, main page for Thingiverse. So. It's showing some, um, you know, popular things in the last 30 days. So you can see all different kinds of things, the door clamp, uh, tripod phone stand, this round shelf, cable holder, you know, Pokemon, an SD card grip. A lot of those kinds of, uh, you know, 
little projects of you know ideas that people have had like oh i need this something to put on the sd card to grip it and someone made one and then uh, gets a lot of likes and you know you can kind of find uh, filter through and find one that's good for you so you can also do searches on different things and you know if you like pokemon and you want to see uh you know like these uh kind of low poly uh pikachus and bulbasaurs uh those are pretty easy to 3D print and, and are pretty quick. These other ones are a little bit um, you know, fancier and take a little bit longer. It's a Pokemon chess set, for example. So, you know, it's kind of like whatever you're interested in, you can, you can look up stuff and uh, find out we were doing um, earlier in the pandemic, we were doing face shields. Um, so, you know, like this uh, surgical mask strap, those kinds of things. So, um, you know, these, these kinds of face shields uh, you can print. So there's a lot of different things you can do. And so say you were interested in this, say you wanted to um, you know, print this round shelf. You can click on it and you know, here's the website for that file. And you're gonna find some of the details, the summary. Um, it's gonna tell you some print settings, so you know, some things that you know, we talked about infill, and they're saying to try and do it 20%. Um, you know, maybe what kind of filament they use it doesn't necessarily mean it's what you have to use, but they're kind of giving you some advice about what made it work for them. Um, there'll be like different pictures of it. And um, you know, comments. Uh, sometimes there are different, you know, people uh, kind of remix it and use it in a different way and they'll put those files there. So then if you want to actually make it, you, you, you hit download all, all files. And these are usually going to be the STL files. So then once you print them, you would import them into the slicer software and then uh, turn it into a G-code. But it's actually pretty simple. Um, you know, once you find what you're interested in, it's usually just a matter of kind of putting it into, the, you know, downloading it, putting it into the slicer software, and um, just making sure that it prints correctly. So uh, here, I'm going to show you the Prusa slicer. Oops, I'm ahead of myself here. Um, okay, so this is the slicer software. So as you can see, what you're looking at is basically this um, digitally. It's the, the build plate for the Prusa, and it's just in that. Uh, Prusa Slicer software. And so what you would do is you go to file um, and import. So this is where you import an STL or OBJ file. So for example, here was just um, a sample of this thing called the Octoprint, which is also, a, I won't get into that, but it's also a software that we use to uh, print the G codes. But it's basically this uh, little octopus looking guy. And so as you can see, it's on the build plate and um, you, know, you have different uh, things of support. Say you wanted uh, support just on the build plate or you want to, uh, usually we'll do supports everywhere. Uh, then you press slice now. So as you can see, you look at the bottom there and where it's purple, that's where it's actually hitting the build plate. And you see all this green is the supports. So essentially, when it would print, it would print like this, but you would take the supports would kind of easily come off. Um, but it, it would help to print with all the overhead. So if you wanted just the build plate, that would look like that. Um, if you want no supports, you know, this is how it would look. And as you can see down here, you got the estimated printing time. So, you know, it's an hour and 22 minutes to print this. Say you wanted to do it with the supports everywhere. Now it's three hours and six minutes. So, you know, there's just some of the things you'd be thinking about. Um, you know, infill of 20%. You wanted, if you wanted the infill of 100%, You know, you wouldn't actually do, but uh, 
uh, three hour, 30 minutes, I guess, not that bad. But usually, so usually you're doing between 15 and 20% down. Um, so you see 15, you know, it takes uh, about 15 minutes less if you're doing 15 as opposed to say uh, 20. Oh, only about three minutes more, but you know, you get the idea. You have the print settings, you know, there's different presets of kind of the draft speed. You know, if you wanted the ultra detail uh, speed, again, it would probably take a lot longer. Nine hours. So if you know if you wanted it to be super detailed, um, it would take nine hours. So generally, when we were printing stuff, uh, it would be like the draft speed. You know, you have some of the print settings here as well in fill. Um, you know, that's there's not too much that you would need to know here, except uh, one of the things that we would always change is the temperature of the bed. Um, we would usually change it to sixty or seventy degrees. Just to make sure it's hot at the bottom where you know where you're first laying down your first layer so that it uh, really attaches to the um, to the bed. Otherwise, uh, sometimes you'd be printing and all of a sudden it would get loose and the print would screw up. Um, yeah, that, that's about it. That's what the slicer looks like. Anyone have any questions uh, right now or? Not, I'll just go into. Um, I just have kind of one other video uh, that I thought was really interesting from uh, Vice News that came out a few months ago about 3D printing is changing the world. You know, so that first video I showed you um, in the early slides was already a few years old. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is still happening, you know, the crazy 3D printing of houses and, and medical stuff that's going on. But uh, this video is about a 10 minute video. And I just thought it showed a lot of really interesting stuff that was happening in the world of 3D printing. Obviously not the kind of stuff we're doing here at the library, but I just thought it would be uh, cool to give you guys, you know, a little bit of a broader perspective on what's happening. So um, I'm gonna play that video for you now. And then afterwards, if you have any questions, you'll let me know. In the 3D bioprinting rooms, we like to keep everything sterile. When you're using cells, you don't want to contaminate anything. So gloves and then your lab coat. And so it's basically you're just printing body parts? Is that what's going on? Right. You want to do the honors? Sure. So I'm about to 3D print a human ear. The Wake Forest Institute for Regenerative Medicine is developing methods to manufacture human tissue, using specialized 3D printers to fabricate a range of functioning, viable body parts. So here we are 3D printing skin. Uh -huh. um, so the aim of this is basically to uh, make printers where you could print sheets and sheets of it and then basically be able to transplant it on a patient who needs it. Wow. We have a couple of demos set up here. The first one here is a, uh, an artificial heart valve, and it's forcing fluid back and forth, and that is an artificial blood vessel. It's actually meant to be a carotid artery, like in the neck. And so then the idea is you can take out the part that isn't working and then put this in. How different is this from like 3D so printing a trinket? Like the, the exact same concept. You take um, a 3D CAD file, and then you convert that into your printing code and then you can print it. The only difference here is that we've got all the biomaterials and your cellular components too. And where do, where do the cells come from? Depending on the patient, you can take a postage sized stamp of cells and then turn it into all the different cell types of the body. And then how do you implant it? You just sew it on? Exactly, S it. suture it on and <laughs> cover it up and you're good to go. Amazing. Well, one of the major challenges in medicine, of course, is not having a sufficient number of tissues and organs that you can use to re replace inpatients. And so 
the concept here is why not just create them? How long do you think it is until you can print a whole body? Well, I remember watching the very first uh, Westworld movie. You know, mm -hmm. it came out in the movie theaters many years ago. Sure. Uh, is that possible in the future? You never know. Science has few boundaries. In 2009, the patent behind the key method of 3D printing expired. And as more followed, so did a new revolution in desktop 3D printing. Printers got smaller and cheaper, allowing anyone to print models, parts, and tools on demand. And nerdy hobbyists turned their printing passions into a multi-billion dollar industry. So we're at the worldwide headquarters of Form Labs, one of the biggest 3D printing manufacturers in the world. And like any respectable startup, they've got a ping pong table. <laughs> and this is Max, he's the founder and CEO. <laughs> The first 3D printing uh, technologies were invented in the early 80s, but it was still really inaccessible to most people who could benefit from it because the machines were so expensive and also really difficult to use, and they didn't necessarily see the potential for a 3D printer that would be a lot lower cost and would be more like, say, an office 2D printer. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Ooh, it's in the goo. There was a lot of excitement at the beginning of this kind of desktop 3D printing wave that 3D printers will be in all of our homes. But it's proven to be a lot further off than everyone hoped for. Cool. So if there was sort of a 3D printing hype cycle, now that we're kind of past it, what does the future look like? 3D printing is used in pretty much every product development process. What's coming soon with 3D printing is going into production, and so it has the potential to take years of product development and moving into manufacturing and turn that into weeks even. Wow. That's, so that's huge. That's huge. We're in Boston going to a company called Desktop Metal that has innovated 3D printing metal for mass production. It's a lot of printers. So yeah, so this is our print farm. We are now inside of it. And what you see is the, the printer in action. And they're printing parts like you see here on the table. You know, and the geometry can be you know, very simple, like a, uh, like a gear. Right. right? And uh, it can get very complicated, like this, which is a uh, pneumatic distribution housing. Wow, looks kind of steampunk. In 3D printing, the first 20 years was used for prototyping. And now we're going into a new phase of 3D printing where we, we go from prototyping into mass production, and that has huge implications. So whereas before you had a factory that make one engine component in the US and then another component overseas, and then they ship the stuff around, that set up the whole uh, trade system that we've basically architected the world around. Now you can print parts anywhere as you need them to produce a product. So we're right at the beginning of, of a revolution. Yeah, this is, a, this is a fourth industrial revolution in the making. In addition to fundamentally altering worldwide economic supply chains, now mass-produced 3D printed metal might also upend the way parts are designed from the ground up. Tools are fairly difficult to use to create very, very complex shapes. But with additive manufacturing of metal, we can create crazy shapes. So what we're doing is we're sort of subjecting these parts to this washing machine effect of dynamic transitional forces so what we have is the ability to very quickly create shapes that are very strong and lightweight, where basically the cell mass is distributed only where it's needed. So like because of machine learning, manufactured goods or industrial design will likely mimic biological design? Absolutely. It's not like you tell a computer, make it by or by shape. It's that you tell a computer, give me the most efficient shape, and the shape that you're getting looks bio. While desktop metal is spearheading this new global industrial revolution, researchers at MIT are thinking outside the printer entirely. We visited two labs pushing the limits of material science and challenging the way we think of materials themselves. Essentially, printing is a material science chamber. Like, it got us more and more focused, understanding like what can materials do, how far can we push our products to behave in new ways. This is a, a cellulose-based material. You'll see that it'll morph, you know, just with the moisture of my skin. Mm -hmm. So same thing, but it only transforms by sunlight. You can apply it to windows, like glass facades or skylights. The last category of research that we study is self-assembly. They'll come together slowly over time. They'll make these kind of cubic lattice structures. 
what we're interested in in this scenario is like what's the far futures of fabrication like can we give more and more agency where the materials can make decisions learn adapt perform in ways we've never even imagined whether aided by self-assembly or artificial intelligence turning digital processes into tangible objects is a key factor in how we envision the future of fabrication how would you characterize the work that you do at the Center for Bits and Atoms? We try to understand how digital things become physical things and physical things become digital things. Now, interestingly, the founders of computer science, von Neumann and Turing, the last thing in their life they studied is exactly this question about how computation becomes physical. How to design a machine that communicates a computation for its own construction. The core research project here is now to actually make that. You can think of it as, as the Star Trek replicator, because that's really what this is. This is the future that you're envisioning? Is that what oh, you're it's the about? future that's on the table in front of us. Oh, hello. So these are what we call relative robots, and relative robots are designed to operate specifically within this lattice environment. But what we're working on now is we have robots that can crawl on the structure. The next step is to give bolting end effectors to them so that they can build the structure and have an army of these things building a big structure oh, in space. Oh, I see what you're saying. When you have armies of these robots building high-performance structures for you, possibilities are going to be endless. It's going to help us get to Mars. It's going to help us get to other galaxies. It's going to help us explore the universe. I'm in. It might sound far-fetched, but all the technologies we've seen are converging in pursuit of a civilization on Mars. And NASA's manufacturing wing is revolutionizing how we'll use 3D printing to get there. So this is a laboratory training complex. It's um, pretty much a one-to-one uh, mock-up of the U.S. lab on um, space station right now. This is actually our backup for the first 3D printer uh, that we ever launched to space. Mm -hmm. The space station is an amazing vehicle. We're still somewhat Earth-dependent with our space station model. For Mars, we want to be Earth-independent. Space does really drive home how important it is to conserve. You know, what are we really going to need for in-space manufacturing to, to make these parts? What you really have to do is have sustainability. This is the refabricator. So it's the first ever integrated 3D printer and recycler all in one. We want to be able to, in one machine, 3D print the part, and then when you're done with it, you just feed it back in and it creates new filament and you can make a whole new part. What excites me the most is that closed loop life cycle. It may seem like a long time before we're going to Mars, it's really not, and we have to work on these technologies today to be ready. Is the 3D printer gonna help us get to Mars? Absolutely, 1,000%. Back on Earth, a startup in Los Angeles is reimagining how we could rapidly automate the production of orbital rockets. So that's a 3D printer? Yes, this is a Stargate, which we developed and built ourselves, and it's the largest metal 3D printer in the world. Why did you call it Stargate? There's a video game called Starcraft, uh -huh. and Stargate <laughs> is what you build to warp in spaceships, <laughs> and so we named it after that, because we're warping in spaceships. The thing is massive. Fundamentally, what we're doing is feeding in uh, aluminum wire okay. and then melting it with a very high power 11 kilowatt laser. So it's like a big soldering arm. Like a, uh, like with a like... laser, yeah, <laughs> with a laser. This is the first large part that we made, which was a fuel tank. Normally getting a tank of this size um, in like aerospace or rocket quality um, would take you well over 12 months. How long did it take you to make this? Uh, it's like seven days of print time. Actually. Seven days. Now that it's developed, yeah, seven days, yeah. If you think about 10 years from now, if your company starts making more and more rockets, what does that mean? Well, our long-term mission was we want to be the first company to 3D print a rocket on Mars. So you're 3D printing rockets to send a 3D printer to Mars to 3D print more rockets? To come back to Earth, yeah. <laughs> yeah. With limited time to do something in your life, like why not just do something very ambitious? The idea is it could inspire other people to go after their dreams, much like I was inspired... By StarCraft. By StarCraft, <laughs> yeah, yeah, by StarCraft. Since the beginning of time, the act of making something using tools is one of the most defining traits of humans. When people look back on the fourth industrial revolution, what was the enabling technology? It's going to be manufacturing, and it's going to be manufacturing with total freedom. You know, it's interesting, right? Because science fiction really does predict many times real science. In a way, that's what you're seeing right now, coming full circle. Science fiction becoming science fact.
All right. So I know that takes us a little bit farther beyond, uh, you know, kind of the plastic uh, 3D printers that we have here at the library. But I just thought that was really cool to see kind of where uh, where things are going. Um, especially you see, like for example, the way they're taking that uh, you know 3D printer to space that also recycles the material, so that you know basically uh, printing stuff and then putting it into a recycler and reprinting different things. Very cool. You guys have any questions? Um, you know, I just saw somebody came in uh, at the last minute, but we do post these um, on YouTube afterwards. So you know, if you missed it, you can always uh, check in there to uh, catch what you missed. Uh, but let me know if you have any uh, questions. I really thank you for coming. Uh, our next tech talk is going to be about um, book recommendations and how to use different um, software and websites to uh, better get book recommendations. Any uh, questions? I see you guys are on mute, but if you don't have questions, it's fine too. But uh, you, know, you, can all, you can type them too if you want. I'll give you a minute to uh, say any questions if you got them. Otherwise, uh, again, thanks for coming and uh, I really appreciate it. Hopefully that was a decent overview of um, what 3D printing is and you know, the kind of 3D printers that we have here and the process of how you get something, how you either create a project or find one on the internet and um, actually print it. And hopefully uh, once all this COVID stuff is over, you know, we'll be open in a more, in a broader sense and have the makerspace uh, up and running where, you know, people can come in and experiment with themselves. Oh. Sorry, you, uh, you said someone unmuted. I don't know if uh, I couldn't hear you though. You know, one of the cool things that we did too was you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a you know big shortage of PPE, and so a bunch of uh, the libraries and us included, we were using the 3D printers to uh, 3D print the face shields. And so it was um, it was sort of an, an approved uh, model that they uh, from I think it was the National Institute of Health, and we were um, printing that model, and then you basically using uh, like plastic um, like office uh, cover, like a report cover. So you get those at Staples and you know, you would uh, put the three hole punch in it and it would attach to the top. So you're basically putting the, the part of your head and then putting this almost like report cover uh, that would attach to it and putting that over uh, your head and then using um, uh, rubber bands to uh, keep it attached to your head. So kind of like this Low tech, high tech uh, hybrid thing that uh, we were actually, I, I delivered them to um, the hospitals, um, delivered, I think, over 60 to uh, National University Medical Center, a bunch of different places. So, and then, you know, they, at that point, they were really ha happy to, to have that extra help. And it was just a really cool way to, um, you know, kind of bring it from, you know, printing cute little dogs and trinkets to actually printing something that, you know, was making a difference. Um, we, we even got uh, called out uh, by um, Laura Curran, the county executive, uh, saw what we were doing and she had uh, congratulated us and mentioned it on uh, social media. So that was kind of cool as well. So, you know, it, 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 there's a lot of different uses and it um, be interesting to see where, where it takes people. All right, so if there's no other questions, I think I'm gonna end the, program. And again, thank you so much for coming. And I hope we'll see you back. Feel free to email me if you have any uh, questions that you want to say now.